Hey everybody, welcome to BI 101 Explorations in Biology. This is Dr. Duncan. I'm going to be your instructor for this semester. Uh, today's topic is going to be Alabama biodiversity and why it matters. Uh, the uh, today's uh, what I'm going to do today is review, um, kind of give you a preview of what we're going to be covering during this semester, um, especially what we're going to be covering in these next few weeks. Uh, but a couple of reminders first. Um, as this is your first lecture for the course, let me remind you that there's a study guide that goes along with the uh, textbook reading assigned for today's lecture. And I also want to remind you and suggest that very strongly that you take notes during these lectures. Um, and if you sit there sort of passively listening, you'll get some information, but you won't retain a lot. The best way to do this is to listen for a bit take some notes, listen for a bit more, take some more notes, and so forth. That sort of active approach is what will really help you uh, learn this material. Um, biology courses are very heavy in content that's necessary in order for us to get to the bigger concepts. In other words, we got to learn a lot of little, little bits of content in order to understand big ideas like evolution and climate change and things like that. So that means you're going to need to master a lot of uh, content to get to the bigger concepts for this for the course. And the best way to do that is to use active learning strategies. I've got a whole a page devoted to that uh, on Moodle um, on the section uh, that's entitled something like uh, tips for success in the course. So I hope you'll take a look at that. All right. So let's get started. Um, one of the suggestions I have is that you write down any questions you have from this lecture and then bring them to our class discussions when we'll have plenty of time for, uh, for answering those questions. All right, let's get started. Okay, um, so biodiversity is um, a, a term that's short version of the phrase biological diversity. And technically, biodiversity refers to the diversity of ecosystems that you have in an area or the diversity of living communities that you have in that area. And by community, as you'll learn a bit later, a community is all the organisms that live in an area. So you're not including the water, the air, the land, the soil, that sort of thing. You're just talking about the organisms. OK, that's what a community is. And so you can talk about the diversity of communities in an area. Um, you can talk about species biodiversity. And this, for sure, is how most people use the term. So when they say biodiversity, they're really talking about the numbers of species that are found in an area. So, and, it, and that's even true for me. I'm mostly, when I use the term, talking about it at the species level. But there is another layer. You can look down at the level of populations within a species and compare different populations to look at, for example, the genetic diversity or the behavioral diversity that you find in different groups of organisms. So it's a, it's a useful term that can be applied at different levels, but mostly biodiversity refers to the species level. Okay, so one of the things that I think is pretty cool about living in Alabama is that we really rock it out in terms of biodiversity. Um, Alabama has um, more um, species than any other state east of the Mississippi River, and that's about half of U.S. states. Um, if you look at all U.S. states, we are ranked number five for total numbers of species at about uh, uh, 4,500 species or so. And um, if the states that are ahead of us are California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, in that order um, from first to fourth, and those are all large Western states. Two of them have access to the oceans. All of them have mountains and deserts and a huge range of uh, climate zones in the state. And that's why those states are so high in terms of uh, their biodiversity. Alabama is also notable for the number of endemic species we have. So this is probably a new term for you. And when you say something is endemic to an area, you're saying that it's only found in that area. For example, um, we have 144 species in Alabama that are endemic to Alabama. That means they're only found in the state of Alabama. We have many others that are found 
in Alabama that we share with other states. Um, nice of us to share, of course, right? Um, but uh, only, but but it's about 144 that are only found in the state. So for a state that's our size, uh, that's a pretty high number. Um, but a lot of our species are uh, mostly. There's a lot of species that are not endemic to the state, but they are mostly found just in Alabama, and a few of them in their populations are found in Tennessee or Georgia or Florida, for example. Okay. Now, um, one of the things that we're going to be doing during the next few weeks is answering this question, why does Alabama have so many species? And um, I'll, right off the bat, I'll tell you that it's not because of our state size. We are ranked number 25 for land area in the U.S., um, but we have, um, and yet we're ranked up near the top in terms of biodiversity. So that does, size doesn't explain it. So let's look at some particular aspects of Alabama's biodiversity. And I want to um, start off with uh, freshwater fishes. Alabama has more freshwater fish species than any other state in the U.S., like by a long shot, too. And um, that's also true for all of North America. We've got a concentration of fish biodiversity here. And they range from everything from the colorful darters like you see here with the vermilion darter, which is found right here in Birmingham, to strange species like this cave fish over to the right, which is only found underground in cave streams. How cool is that? Um, that's the Alabama cave fish. That's one of our endemics. In fact, all three of these are endemic species to Alabama. Um, down below here, we see the uh, Alabama sturgeon, um, a species that is either extinct or just barely hanging on. We've seen very few of them in the last decade or so. Um, and these are some of the, the really cool fish species that we have in the state. All right, so we're a hot spot for fish biodiversity. Uh, what else? We are number one for mussel species. Now, mussels, um, you might call them clams. Some people might call them clams, but the technical term for them is mussels. And from the outside, they're kind of boring looking. They're kind of brown and lumpy. But on the inside, they often have bright colors. Um, for a long time, uh, people would harvest mussels to try to find freshwater pearls. And then they were used in the button industry back before we had plastics. Um, but mussels have some crazy biology that we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, they do things that you, it, it's, it's mind-blowing. I'll, I'll show you some videos about that. It's, it's some pretty cool stuff. Anyway, in terms of mussels, we are the number one state for mussel biodiversity, and we are the global hotspot for biodiversity for mussels. That means that if you look at all the world and then you look at, like, the map of the world with where all the mussel species are on the planet, like Alabama lights up. It is on fire with the total number of mussel species. Okay, moving on here. Um, same is true for crayfish species. Now, basically, when I grew up, I thought there was one species of crayfish, and it was boiled, and you could either get it like really hot or kind of medium or mild, and those are the varieties of crayfish that you had. Um, the uh, crayfish, crawfish, mud bugs, whatever you want to call them, it's all good. Um, as it turns out, Alabama is the number one state for crawfish um, biodiversity, and we are, again, the global hotspot for that. Another group of organisms that we're famous for is freshwater snails. There's, uh, we're the number one state for freshwater snails, and again, we are the global hotspot for snail biodiversity, freshwater snail biodiversity. Uh, so again, it's pretty cool to be in a place that's got this much biodiversity. You know, um, very few states in the U.S. can make these kinds of claims about any group of organisms. Uh, we're number one for damselfly species. These are those little um, insects you see flying around, often low over the grass, like your lawn or something like that, or usually near wetlands. And they're brightly colored, and um, they're kind of like dragonflies um, in, in the way that they fly around. Anyway, we are number one state for damselfly species. We are number one state and global hotspot for carnivorous plants. These are plants that actually capture and digest animals to get their nutrients. They get their energy from the sun. That's why they're green. They do photosynthesis. But they are designed as these traps that, to catch everything from like ants to flies to sometimes 
um, uh, lizards, and I've even heard a report of a small bird being trapped in one one time. Anyway, um, these are carnivorous plants, and they get their nutrients, like they're, think of it like vitamins. Um, they're getting that from, from trapping other organisms. And we are the number one state and global hotspot for carnivorous plants. Let's look at uh, turtles. We are the number one state for freshwater turtles. And in fact, the lower part of the state, the Mobile Tensaw Delta, where um, the watersheds of the state come together right above Mobile Bay, that, has the, that spot has the highest concentration of turtle species on the entire planet. We are also number one state for uh, frog species. We have 32 species by the last statistics that I heard. Um, and in terms of salamanders, I've not seen a ranking for salamanders, but I know from looking at maps and the data that I have seen that we're near the top. Um, if you, um, so sometimes uh, biologists talk about herp uh, herpetology, or they talk about like biologists being herpetologists. Herpetology is the study of both amphibians and reptiles. Now it's kind of a, a goofy field because it's like, Reptiles and amphibians are so very different in many ways, but it's kind of like tradition that, that herpetologists are sort of lumped together here, um, those that study reptiles and those that study amphibians. <clears throat> and if you combine reptile and amphibian species in the state, um, we rank number three for herpetological diversity across U.S. states. Cave biodiversity. Um, so uh, Alabama has a tremendous concentration of caves, mostly in the northern part of the state. And we have um, in those caves, there's lots of water. And of course, bats go in there and things like that. So there's actually a lot of things that live in caves. I mean, it's not like you'd find as many species as you'd find on the surface, but you still find species. And they tend to be in these sort of isolating situations where they uh, tend to become their own new species and, and evolve some really cool um, adaptations. We'll talk about that process in a couple weeks. Anyway, the up in the northeastern part of Alabama where it collides with Georgia and Tennessee, that region up there has a type of geology that makes lots and lots of caves. And that region has, um, if you compare it to all the other cave regions in the world, it ranks number three in terms of biodiversity among those locations outside of the tropics. You go into the tropics, the, the warm equatorial region of the planet, and the caves have lots more cave biodiversity. But in terms of the cooler zones of the planet, we are ranked number three. Or we share that with Georgia and, and Tennessee. Okay, so all of this is like pretty cool, but you might be asking yourself, all right, so what? So Dr. Duncan thinks that all this biodiversity is pretty exciting. You know, bugs and critters and things, they're okay, but like, so what? What, is, what does this matter um, in, in the grand scheme of things? Well, that is a very legitimate question, because if biologists like me can't answer this question, um, then we're not doing our job. So let's take a look at some of the answers that we'll find for this question over the next couple of weeks. Um, let me start off by pointing out that we are in the middle of what's called an extinction crisis. Extinction is the loss of species forever from everywhere on the planet. Um, once a species is gone, it's gone, period. It, there's no way to bring it back. Um, although there are some folks working on that with genetics, but it'll never be the same. So um, it, the extinction crisis is, of course, um, the result of the way that we humans are living on the planet. And we'll talk a lot about this over the next, oh, over the entire semester. Um, let's take a look at some stats to, to illustrate the extinction crisis, and then I'll tie this into answering that question, so what? Um, Alabama, as it turns out, ranks really highly in terms of the number of species that have gone extinct. Pictured here are, are just a sampling of the many species that are no longer found on planet Earth as a result of extinction. And if you look at this list that I've got here for you, you see that Hawaii is ranked number one for extinctions. And with 217 species, it's way ahead of Alabama, like over twice as much. Islands, as we'll learn later, um, are a special case for extinction. Their populations tend to be really small and vulnerable. 
And we humans, when we colonize and live on islands, we bring other species with us and they tend to outcompete and bully the, uh, the native species and drive them to extinction. Um, and we also sometimes directly through overhunting and stuff like that causes extinctions. A lot of that history we'll talk about uh, coming up. So islands are in a are particularly vulnerable class of, of geog geography in terms of extinctions. So if we just look at US states that are on the continent, um, Alabama ranks number one for extinctions. And even the state that would rank number two, California, um, California is like just over half as many extinctions as Alabama. So Alabama has lost a tremendous number of species compared to other U.S. states, with the exception of Hawaii, which itself is very exceptional. Now, the extinction crisis is more than just in Alabama. I, if it were just in Alabama, we would be in a much better shape uh, as a species than we are today. And you'll, I'll explain why in just a few minutes. Um, the extinction crisis is global. It's across the U.S., it's around the world, northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, the developed world, the developing world, etc. A report that sort of summarized this and sort of brought the stats up to speed um, came out in 2019. You're looking at the title page of that right here. And it predicts that by the end of this century, if we don't change the way that we're living on the planet, that a million species will go extinct. Now, is that a lot of species or what? Well, it's a lot of species. Um, it's estimated that there are about 10 million species on the planet. Um, there, and that means that we are looking at losing 10% of the species that are on the planet in this coming century, with a lot of those happening just in the next few decades. Now, um, this might be alarming to you, or again, you might be like, okay, that's kind of bad, but you know, as long as I got Wi-Fi, everything will be okay, right? Um, at least that's what my, my daughter seems to think anyway. Okay, maybe that wasn't fair. She'd probably hate me if she knew that I said that. But the bottom line is we have our human needs. We have our distractions. We, got, we have to meet our, our needs for food, for shelter. Um, we're in an era now of addressing um, social justice issues. A lot of things are going on. Why should we be worried about all these little species that are out there? Isn't this just the price to pay for progress? Well, people have been saying that a long time, that extinctions are just like, well, you know, that's just collateral damage for us humans doing what we need to do in order to, you know, to live well on the planet. Unfortunately, there's a whole... Lay, there are layers and layers of fallacies behind that, which we'll explore this semester. Um, to begin unpacking that a bit, I want to show you this, this graph. This is kind of a complicated graph, so let me explain it to you. And we are going to revisit this graph in a couple of weeks, but let me go ahead and get you thinking about this. This is a graph that was put together by the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden. And um, these are some of the top global scientists that look at the planet as a whole and the systems of the planet that help keep humanity alive. Um, you'll notice, for example, fresh water use down here. We all got to have our fresh water. OK, um, you can look at other things like um, our, the health of our oceans. A lot of people like almost a, I think it's about a third of humans get their protein from the ocean. They're not eating steak and, and, and pork and things like that. They're eating fish that was caught out of, out of the local uh, oceans just uh, days before, if not minutes or hours before. And so these are the nine planetary systems on which humanity depends. And this is basically a circular bar graph, um, this being sort of like where uh, at the very center, like the zero point, and as you go out from the from the center out toward the margins, you're looking at more and more impact of humans on that system. So, for example, let's take a look at um, at a land system change over here. Um, this showing us that we've converted roughly this much along this scale of um, of of the land surfaces on the planet we've converted to human use. Now the other way to the other thing that you need to learn about this graph when you look at it is down here in the lower right there's a key 
And in the green zone here, which is represented by this thick, dark um, dotted line, this is the safe zone. If we humans keep our impact in this within the safe zone, we're going to be okay. We're going to be fine. Things will be messy from time to time, but we will not destroy the Earth systems that keep us around. Um, the yellow zone here is the zone of uncertainty, where the risk is increasing. In other words, we've changed so much of a one of these planetary systems that we're incurring uh, are causing more and more risk to the survivability of the planet for humans. Okay, and then this final dotted line here, this boundary that you see here, is the the boundary into which um, you see the zone of uncertainty. In other words, it's high risk. And the reason it's phrased zone of uncertainty is because we've never done this before. We don't know what's going to happen um, when we take the planet and convert. Um, this much land use change um, beyond this point to just earth, just human dominated systems. Or we don't know what happens when we go beyond this boundary layer here for how much fresh water we're using on the planet and so forth. Okay. Now, um, so that's how this, this graph works. What I want to point out is this wedge up here. Um, this is all about biodiversity here. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, and they divide up biodiversity into two different uh, categories. There's one right here, this wedge right here. This is species biodiversity. This is what we've been talking about so far, and it's this category that we are way into the the, the danger zone, the high risk zone, because of all the extinctions that we've already caused on the planet. The other part of this wedge is how those species sustain ecosystems. And, and even though we've been studying ecosystems for, I don't know, about like 60 years or so now, we are still just scratching the surface on how everything's connected and how ecosystems are keeping us around. So they, they just sort of leave this wedge empty. They're like, we don't know how bad it is. We don't have enough of an understanding to, to say anything about that. But in terms of species loss, we are at a really high level here. And we are, that's one of the three areas that we're in the danger zone. Okay, to just quickly summarize here, the bottom line from this is that biodiversity is one of these systems that is important to sustaining humanity, and we are redlining this one. We are way into the danger zone here in terms of the extinctions that we've caused and the fact that so many populations now are down to small sizes. All right, so let's dig into why biodiversity is related to um, how humanity lives and our and our well-being, our environmental security, and so forth. And this all ties to this concept of called ecosystem services. These are the things that ecosystems do for us for free. Um, so, for example, uh, take take a deep breath. All right, that oxygen that you just uh, inhaled and, and went into your bloodstream there to keep you alive, that oxygen was produced by plants. Most of it produced by very tiny microscopic algae that live out in the oceans of the world that produce the, most of the world's oxygen. But it's also the plants, the grasses, the trees, the shrubs, and things like that that are around you, okay? Those things do all this for free. We don't have to go out and put quarters into a tree in order to get it to pump out some oxygen. It just does it for free. That's an ecosystem service. There are many different types of ecosystem services. We're going to spend a whole day talking about them in, in a couple weeks. Um, to illustrate the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem services, I want to illustrate that by way of a food web. Now you've probably heard of food chains before where you know, a little fish is eaten by a bigger fish, uh, and the bigger fish is eaten by a ginormous fish, and so forth and so on. Okay, that's a food chain. That's a really simplified, kind of overly simplified way of looking at um, ecosystems. Instead, ecologists see that there's many, many different connections between species and an ecosystem. And they try to draw that or illustrate that to, to communicate this by way of these things that, are, that you see here called food webs. So this is a food web for out on an ocean. I don't know which ocean it was. I can't remember where I grabbed this, but it looks like it was from Canada. So this is a Canadian um, uh, oceanic food web. 
and each of the circles represents a different species and or a group of very similar species so for example you'll see they've got all seals lumped together here instead of having like eight different dots for different seal species okay and um, this particular food web what it's illustrating is the feeding relationships between these organisms okay so for no example at least seals here at the top center they are eating uh, different species of, of hake which is a type of fish and they're also eating different species of herring there's a couple of them here and so forth and so on they're eating some squid from time to time okay so this is showing the feeding relationships between different species in this ecosystem and you can imagine now how after seeing all these connections, you can imagine how devastating it would be to this ecosystem if you were to lose one of these circles. That's what extinction is. You are eliminating one of the species in the ecosystem on which many other species depend. And that's why extinction is such a threat to our ecosystems, because if you remove too many species, the whole ecosystem changes to a degree that we call it a collapse. It doesn't disappear, but it collapses to a much more simple state that doesn't provide as many ecosystem services. In the case of these oceanic um, ecosystems, what kind of services do they provide? Well, um, a big one is, is, uh, is all the food that we take from the ocean. A lot of the species of fish you'll see here, like herring and, um, and salmon, these are the salmon species up here, um, and some of these other species that you see here, like rockfish, these are all species that we rely on for, for protein, for feed, for food. And, um, and so that's the kind of service that the, one of the many services our oceans provide. Okay, so ecosystem services, uh, you'll see this graph again in the future. This is to illustrate how there's four different types of ecosystem services. There's the, um, provisioning services where we actually take things from ecosystems and use it, whether it's water or fish or, or game or something like that. There are the um, regulating services where ecosystems provide um, things that help keep our environment uh, stable and also help protect us. So, for example, uh, wetlands will capture floodwaters and reduce flooding in our urban areas. So wetlands are providing a, are, are doing an ecosystem service by way of regulating floods, okay? Supporting services are some basic fundamentals to keeping ecosystems alive. Well, okay, wait, let me back that up. Ecosystems aren't alive. Let me restate that. Supporting services keep species alive and keep uh, ecosystems functioning. So for example, that would be the, the cycling of nutrients through our ecosystems. So nitrogen and phosphorus and other important nutrients that are in our bodies and in the bodies of all organisms. They, they come into us, they leave us, they enter other organisms and so forth. That's, psych, that's nutrient cycling and that's one of the supporting uh, services. Okay, And then finally there's cultural services and there's a much longer list than you see here, recreation and ecotourism, but this just illustrates that a lot of what we do, a lot of who we are as a species, is influenced by having other species around us on the planet. We would be a much more boring um, species in terms of our art and our culture and our life ways if we weren't interacting with other species. Um, many of you have pets, right? Imagine a, living in a universe where there are no pets. Um, but for those of us that like to go outside and hike on trails or like to, you know, at least see trees and things like that in our neighborhoods, right? Those are all, these are all parts of cultural ecosystem services, okay? So we'll be talking a lot more about this um, coming up in the next few weeks and why it's important. Now, a couple key um, ecosystem services I want to throw out and show to you and illustrate how they are tied to your daily life. We've already illustrated that by way of the oxygen that we breathe, but also 75% um, of the world's food crops are, depended on, are dependent on pollinating insects. Um, that means that um, only 25% of our food crops can be pollinated by wind. The rest of them depend on, on insects and those insects 
Um, sometimes they're bees that we truck out to these farm fields and stuff like that, but in most cases they're insects that are coming from natural ecosystems, areas that are near our agriculture that are still natural. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that we retain those um, natural areas to provide these um, uh, pollination services. Another example is our medicines. The top selling drugs in the U.S. and in the world were all discovered in nature and thousands more drugs are waiting to be discovered in the forests and the oceans of the world. So we are, when we are destroying our ecosystems, we're basically destroying medicines that could be helping us with everything from cancer to COVID-19 and so forth. So these are all um, some really important reasons to keep biodiversity around, ways that affect us, you and me, on a daily basis. Now, this is a key point I'm going to make a lot this semester. Ecosystems provide more services and better quality services when their native species are present and their populations are healthy. And this is why biodiversity is important for ecosystem services. This is why we should really care about extinction. Um, we need other species around in order to keep ecosystems functioning and providing the services on which we depend. When we lose species to extinction, we are basically um, jeopardizing our, our own future. All right. Now, this isn't all sort of like threats about what might be happening in the future. Ecosystem deterioration is already affecting us. 200,000 people in the U.S. die each year from air pollution, and that's mostly through the burning of fossil fuels. That's 200,000. Um, so this is, we are in August 2020 when I'm recording this. I don't think we're yet at 200,000 dead from COVID-19. We're going to get there within the semester, but we're not even there yet. So imagine basically a COVID-19 death toll by December 2020 every year due to air pollution, okay? And this, by the way, doesn't affect everybody all the same, as we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, here's another example. Um, water, having access to, to clean water, to trustworthy water. Uh, you might have heard about the problems with water in Flint, Michigan. Well, just this morning on the news, um, it was an, um, I heard the headline that the state of Michigan has agreed to pay out 600 million to the residents of, of Flint, Michigan, for the um, for the water crisis that the that the that the state and the and the city uh, caused. Um, basically, uh, a lot of people were exposed to lead poisoning, and uh, children especially are susceptible to neurological damage from lead poisoning. And um, this is why that settlement is so high, and why this has been so alarming. And one of the points that I want to make here, and we're going to touch on this throughout the semester, is that not everyone is threatened by ecosystem biodiversity loss as much as everyone else. Um, people of color and the poor are the ones that are most affected by environmental degradation. And that's true here in the U.S., and it's true around the world. And um, this, get, this ties directly into issues of social justice because Usually the people that are suffering first and suffering most from environmental decay are not the people that caused the problems. They are not the ones that profited from the industries um, that are causing these sorts of problems. So we really have um, some serious social and environmental issues that are all tied up together here. We have a lot of problems here to, to, to solve. Um, the future is not looking so great either. Um, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time this semester looking at climate change and why climate change has already been affecting your life and degrading your, the quality of your life and how and what the threats are to the future and why it's so important for us to all uh, rally around climate change issues and, and make the changes that we need in the next few years. We do not have much time, and I'll explain that in a, in a couple weeks. Um, this is from the World Health Organization, and it estimates that by the year 2030 to 2050, um, at least 250,000 people will be dying prematurely each year due to climate change. Um, 
I suspect that number is actually a little conservative, um, and it um, we'll see how um, new estimates come out in the next couple of years. But things are the climate is changing a lot faster than we thought it was going to, and it, a lot of people are being in, uh, affected by this, as we will talk about in a lot of detail. Okay, so one of the things that I want to talk about is that um, this is, like I said, it's uh, it's fall 2020. We've had a summer of protest about some issues that we have been neglecting to solve and to address for many years. Um, social justice issues, not just here in the U.S. with the Black Lives Matter and Brown Lives Matter movement, but also around the world. And as this is, all of this is is very important to securing a better future for everyone on the planet, um, regardless of your skin color. Um, but I also want to point out that we also need a safe place to live. Um, if and when we can solve these social problems, we need to also be able to come home to a safe place where we can be with our family, our friends, and our neighbors and not have to worry about pollution and not have to worry about flooding rivers and our neighborhoods flooding and not have to worry about um, uh, uh, diseases that are being spread by global warming and so forth. So that's why environmental issues are tied in directly to social justice issues and we'll be talking a lot about that this semester. Okay, so the road ahead, what kind of things are we going to be talking about? We're going to talk about, first off, how do ecosystems work? That's going to be some of the foundations for understanding everything that we're going to be talking about later in the semester. Ditto with why ecology and biodiversity is important. We're going to spend a lot of time on that. We're going to look at origins. Um, I'm going to talk about evolution in terms of like why, where do species come from? Why can't we just have new species when uh, arise when we've had some extinctions? Um, how hard is it for new species to arise? We'll talk about all that. Um, what are the threats to biodiversity? Why are species disappearing? I mean, are you and I like killing off species in our daily lives? Well, no, not exactly, but kind of, sort of, indirectly. We'll get to all that. Um, why? Is climate change and why is biodiversity loss a threat to humanity? We've already talked a little bit about that this morning. We'll explore that a lot this semester. And then finally, what can we all do about this? Because I don't want us to, I don't want this class to be a downer. We're going to cover a lot of hard topics, some really wrenching stuff. And I'm sorry that I have to be the one to, to bring it to you like that. Um, and but I'm also going to make sure that we talk about the future and the good things that we can do for our future and for ourselves, both for us and biodiversity. And we'll spend a lot of time on that as well. Um, it's a lot of, it's a really big, broad topics that we're covering in this class. And there's just no way I can pack it all into our lectures and your reading times and videos and that sort of thing. I hope that I'm planting seeds with you that will germinate and grow for the rest of your lives. In other words, you will. You will see these topics and you'll understand why they're important and you'll continue learning about them um, as we go forward, as you as you live your life, both your professional life, your civic life and your personal life, because everything we're going to talk about in this course is important for your quality of life and your future. And um, that's what this is all about. All right. That's a wrap for this morning. Um, I will uh, talk to you guys soon in class. Bye.